Now, let's have some more fun. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 18, 16 to 39. 1 Kings 18, 16 to 39. The Bible is fun. It is fun because we learn from it. And one of the things I will tell you is this. No matter what you know about the Bible, no matter what you know in the Bible, no matter what you've learned from the Bible, every day the Bible becomes new. And that's what I've experienced. That's what I've found out. You realize that something you learned a week ago, you go back to that same passage, it becomes fresh again. And something, some new nugget comes up. So that's what we'll do this morning. Um, I, I started this this morning and I'll just try and complete it. Uh, I started talking about God will make it rain, but rebuild your broken altars. God will make it rain. We have not ended the service well. God will make it rain, but rebuild. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Don't you love technology? You know, God will make it rain, but rebuild your broken altar. And I, I, I shared with um, us, um, I talked about this passage, you know, what had happened. But let me start from, let, let's go uh, one up to 19, 19, uh, 1910. First King 1910. Let me start from there. If you go to First King 1910. The Bible says, this was Elijah speaking. Elijah said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life also. If you put the, key, the um, NLT version, the NLT version, says, Elijah replied, I have zealously served God, the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left and now they are trying to kill me. That was how bad things were in Israel. That was how bad things were in Israel in the days of Ahab and his wife um, Jezebel. His wife Jezebel. And I asked the question this morning, who is going to name their daughter Jezebel? Right? Because we know how bad she was. We know how bad she was. And, and if you go back and read that passage, um, 1 Kings 18, 16 to 39, it talks about the time of the reign of Ahab and his wife, Jezebel. And the Bible makes us to understand that while Ahab was king, everything that God told them to do, they threw out. Everything that God said they should do, they did not do. They broke down the altar of God and erected a new altar to Baal. To an idol God. To an idol God. Ahab was so bad. Not just as a king. But as one that was supposed to serve God. It was so bad that... Nobody before him did as much as he did. Not positively, but negatively. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 16 verse 33. 1 Kings 16 33 says, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger. Said he did much more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger. Than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So, whatever anyone did before him was child's play compared to what he did. You know, um, there are some countries of the, in the world. You have a bad ruler. Bad. And we've seen it in Africa, in North America, in Asia, all over the world. They're everywhere. You see a really bad ruler. And you are thinking, ah! This one was bad though. Then suddenly, there's an election. A new ruler comes. A new prime minister comes. A new president comes. And you look at it and say, Ah! In fact, we want the bad one back. Because this one is badder. It doesn't like badder. This is what Ahab was. 
Israel at that point, everything they've been through, the bad leadership that they've had, the idol that they had worshipped, when it came to Ahab, it was a new definition of bad. To the point that if you were a prophet of God, of Jehovah, you were killed. And your place is replaced with a prophet of Baal. They are lucky they didn't do it in today's world. Because some pastors would have just changed. I, I, no, I'm not doing God again. I am now the prophet of Baal. Just for their life. That was how things were. And things got so bad and things displeased God. That God threw Elijah caused a drought in Israel. It caused a drought in Israel. In um, 1 Kings chapter 17, if you go one chapter, verse 1, 1 Kings 17, verse 1, says, And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As long as, as the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these three years, except by my words. God caused Elijah to make a proclamation because things were too ba so bad. When the altar of God is broken down, when the worship of God is replaced with the worship of idols, things get bad. It never works out. It never works out. So Elijah came and said, for the next three years, there will not be rain. Not just that. You know, if there is no rain and there is dew, things will still happen. He said, but there will not be dew. Not only dew, but there will also not be rain. And for three years, there was a drought. For three years, there was a drought. Church, when we look at the world today, it appears that we are going back to the times of Ahab and Elijah. And when I say, when, when we look at the world, I don't want you to look too far. Let's look inwards. Let's look at the church. Let's look at our lives. How are we taking care of the altar of God? Are we still Keeping that altar or have we broken it down? What is priority to us today? How much zeal? Elijah said, I have been zealous for the Lord. How much zeal? How much enthusiasm? How much do we thirst, hunger, and run after God? Things were bad before. COVID even made it worse. You know, now and then we can give an excuse. Pastor Tam, how come we've not seen you in church? You know, this COVID, eh? COVID has suffered. Though. This COVID. You know, it's COVID now. You know, it has made it worse. How much are you giving to God? How much of your time are you giving to God? How much time are you dedicating to the word of God? To studying the word of God? I have said this and I will say it over and over again. Maybe till the end of the year I will keep saying it. Please. If you are not making it a habit. Start it today. Read your Bible. Pray every day. Don't only open your Bible when you are in church. You can never learn anything. You can compare it to being in high school or being in the university. And the only time you open your textbook is when you are in class. When you are done classes, you never go back there, your notes. You fail. If you do not study the word of God, if you do not pray, you've just broken down your altar. If you are not zealous for God and the things of God, 
You can be compared to Israel in the time of Ahab. And the Lord said through Elijah, there's going to be a drought. When we break down the altar of God in our lives, in our families, when we break down the altar of God or when we make God second place in our lives, when we replace the worship of God with the worship of other things, there is going to be a drought in our lives. It's not a curse. But it is what it is. That's what the word of God tells me. You cannot succeed outside of God. If you get rid of God in your life and the things of God in your life, and, and it is so important that we really put this, how do they say it? At the center of our heart every day. Because we do not know when we are going to be called by God. Okay, let me put it in plain English. We do not know when we are going to die. No one is going to die now in Jesus' name. But the truth is this, we, we all will. And I, like I said this morning, just Friday, we had the service, uh, remembrance service for a young man that died at 34. That comes to church. 34 years old, he died. On Friday, we're all here. You guys were here. So many glowing things were said about him, but it doesn't bring him back. And if you've broken down the altar of God and God calls you home, what report will you give? What report will you give? You will just leave him alone. Let him enjoy himself. They are the owners of the church. Leave them. Eh? Praise God. Amen. So it is so important that please, please, please today. Any way that you've broken the altar of God in your life, in your home, in your family, build it now. Build it now. Build it now. Build it now. If you look around today, the altar of God is being replaced by other altars. The altar of... Give me altar. Someone, give me which... What are we replacing the altar of God with? Who said that? God bless you. Social media. Now, okay, I'm not saying social media is bad. I'm on social media. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, I'm on, I'm on what's it all, babe? Um, I've forgotten. I just said the ones that I use mostly. WhatsApp is just TikTok. I'm on TikTok. Don't ever go to TikTok because you'll stay there for one week. One week. You know when they send you things on TikTok and you say you want to look at it, you just go there. Before you know, you go to the next one. And before you know, it's two hours. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you know, and, and the way I look at things, there's, there's even um, things like TV. I'm not saying they're bad, but the way I look at it is this. Sometimes I sit down and I ask myself, I've just been on social media for one hour and 30 minutes. And I'm not joking, I've been there before for one hour and 30 minutes. I'm being vulnerable here. So don't think that pastor does not go on social media. I now ask myself, have I spent one hour, 30 minutes praying or studying the word of God? Then I ask myself, my wife is here, she can tell you, what have I benefited? What have I benefited? What have I gained from that one hour, 30 minutes that I've just been on social media, I've watched uh, on TikTok, I've watched, uh, what are those things I do? The different things uh, in the TikTok. You would act as if you don't know. Don't you know one leg, eh? No, I'm just saying, not you, I'm not pointing at you. I'm just saying, everybody, everybody's just quiet. I say, I don't know. Don't you watch them do booger? You are acting as if you don't know. Uh-uh. Eh, uh, eh, uh, Sabinus. Oh. Sabinus is funny. 
But what I'm saying here is, there's nothing wrong in doing that, but you need to ask yourself the question. Because when you are on it for one hour, and you do not go back to the word of God for one hour, or for ten minutes, or at all, you've just broken the altar of God. That's what I mean. So I say it again. I go on social media. There's nothing wrong with it. It becomes a problem when that is where you live. Okay, what else? How do we replace? What else we used to replace the altar of God? Netflix, movies, movies, work, work, food. So food we eat or food we cook? Both of the above. Huh? Who said PS5? You are pointing at someone. See, let me say this. There's nothing wrong with all of that. It is the time we dedicate. And always ask yourself, how much time am I giving to the things that does not add, a, give, add to eternal value and the things that add to eternal value? That is the way I do it. Now we are beginning to expose ourselves. Let me move on. What about zealousness? What kind of zeal do we have for God? For the things of God. Elijah said, I've been zealous for the Lord. Zealousness. Ah, zealousness is waning. I remember once I said, ah, we are going to have vigil, nine vigil. Man, when are we starting? Eight o'clock. When are we ending? One o'clock. Ah, ah. Did we kill Jesus Christ? You know, um, let me say this again. It's not the length of prayer. Let me be clear. But pray that you are not desperate for prayer. Hmm. Pray that you are not desperate for prayer. Worldliness creeping into the church. It's breaking the altar of God. You know, like I said this morning, instead of the church setting the standard, we are taking the standard of the world to come and change the church. That's a misnomer. That's a misnomer. Where God and the things of God have been relegated to the back burner. Where the hunger and testing of God and the things of the hunger and testing of the things of the world now replacing, replaces the hunger and the testing of the things of God. The psalmist says in Psalm 41 verse 1 sorry 42 verse 1 Psalm 42 verse 1 says as the deer pants for the water brook so pants my soul for you O God. Are you panting for him? When does Premier League start again? <laughs> Hallelujah. You know those Sunday games? You know? I, I, I support the best team. Arsenal. And for some reason, they put them on Sunday always. Most of the time. I don't know why. And I had to change once because when I'm in church, I put, I have the app. Since I cannot watch it, it will give me updates. And I remember, you guys, some of you remember, I was here sharing the word of God. And they scored Arsenal like they normally do. <laughs> and I said, they scored us again. I'm sharing this with you because don't, don't look at me like um, I'm human. But I'm a human that loves God. And that's the key thing. But the minute we begin to give our attention to other things, it takes our attention away from the things that are important. And when that happens, the altar of God has been destroyed. And when the altar of God is destroyed, drought begins to come in. When the altar of God is destroyed in your life, 
there are consequences and there are repercussions. And I shared, did I share two consequences this morning? Or one? One. I shared one consequence. Let me share two consequences. One of the consequences of a broken altar, of a broken altar of God is that even though God promises you rain that will cause a blessing, as noted in Joel chapter 2, verse 23 and 24, Joel 2, 23 and 24, that rain will be held back. That rain will be held back. Because if you look at the story of Israel, the Bible says that Elijah came and said, there will be no rain. There will be no rain. Then later the Lord said to Elijah, if you go to 1 Kings chapter 18, verse um, 1, the Lord said to Elijah, go show yourself to the king says, when you show yourself to the king, that rain will come, right? It says, and I will send rain on the earth. But that was not all. For the rain to come, Elijah had to rebuild the broken altar of God. Remember before, uh, when he was at Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal were there with him. Before Elijah rebuilt the, the altar, the Bible says the prophets of Baal demonstrated on the altar their own altar. The altar that had been broken, they were demonstrating and nothing happened. But when it was time for Elijah, what did he do? He first built the altar. When the altar of God is broken in your life, consequence number one, there will be drought. There will be no rain. No matter the promise of rain that God gives you, it will not rain. And you don't want your life to experience a drought. Have you seen a, um, um, earth that has experienced drought, no rain? It is cursed, it is broken, nothing grows on it. That means there won't be progress in your life. Another consequence is this. When you break the altar of God, because when you break the altar of God, you are replacing it with another altar. And whatever altar you replace it with is the altar that you will serve to. And we are told in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 35. Jeremiah 32, verse 35. That they have built pagan shrines to Baal in the valley of Ben-Hinnon. And there they sacrificed their sons and daughters to Molech. When we break the altar of God. And we erect an altar to Baal. We will give to Baal. We will sacrifice our children to bear. And when we talk about sacrificing your children, don't look at it as doing what um, um, Abraham was told to do. Take your child, put him on the altar. No, that's not it. Ask yourself this question. And some people give some good answers this morning. What altar have I erected in my home that I've sacrificed my children to? We talked about some of them. Social media. I was watching something on social media. A young child. You know, children are basically see-do. What they see you do is what they will do. Right? I've shared this story before. Years ago, my elder sister went to a party. You know, my, I, we had my niece was at home. You know? My elder sister went to a party, but they needed to go for this party, so they used my niece. as They were taking my niece out. You know? So they took young child took her to the party and they kept her somewhere and they were doing their party and they were dancing. Then, when they came back home, this is my niece, very young child. She said, this is how Auntie so, -so, -so and so was dancing in the party. She started to dance the same way. They are see, do. When you sacrifice, when you break down the altar of God in your home and you erect the altar of alcohol and you erect the altar of, we talked about social media, all you do is social media, don't be surprised that that is what you sell your children to. If all you do is you come home and because once you take God out of the equation, 
your action becomes anti-God, you'll find out that that is what your children are drawn to. That's what they are drawn to. If the altar you have erected, like someone said this morning, is that in your home, you do not even care about morning devotion. What you are giving your children to is a life without God. You are sacrificing them to a life without God. If prayer is not important to you, I know a family very close to us. Every time they get into their house, and I'm not joking, they do it till this day. Every time they step into their house, as they get into the door and shut the door, the first thing they do is pray. Father, thank you for bringing with the children. Father, thank you for bringing us back home safely. Father, that's amazing. What are they doing? They are sacrificing their children on the altar of the Almighty God. And that's what they will grow to become like God. Consequence. Consequence. So think about it. Have you broken down the altar of God in your life? Have you broken down the altar of God in your family? Have you made all things... Um, have you made all things permissible in your home, in your life? Everything goes. It doesn't matter. You know, it's um, this, you know, we are in a, how did they say it? We are in a new, you know, we are jet age, you know, internet age. Things are not the way they used to be. If God does not change, his standard is still the same. The internet cannot change the standard of God. A brand new car that is called electric car cannot change the standard of God. Those things will come and they will go. But God remains the same. So we need to confront and change. Please listen to me. We need to change. If an altar, if you've broken the altar of God, build it back. If you want your life to be better, build it back. Build it back. And how do you build that altar back? And change the trajectory of your life. Three ways that Elijah did. The first thing that Elijah did was this. He boldly challenged everyone about following God. He boldly challenged everyone about following God. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Brother Emmanuel. If someone walks up to you today, they know that you are a believer, a Christian. I'm, I'm correct, right? You are a Christian, right? You're sure? Very sure. Okay. Someone walks up to you and they've known you for one year. They've seen you. They work with you regularly and say, tell me something. Do you smoke? How would you feel? <laughs> what comes to my mind is, am I giving that vibe? Am I giving that vibe that I smoke? Now, the reason why you, be, you may be asking me is because I am not giving the vibe that I am a believer, I'm a follower of Christ. Because there are some things you dare not ask me. How dare you ask me that I smoke, that I drink? Uh, no, I drink water. You understand? So let me not just generalize. Do you understand? Damn, someone is like someone coming to me now. Fola Kemi walks up to me. Pastor Tam, she calls me Pastor Tam. Do you like clubbing? <laughs> Do you understand? I will start asking myself, what kind of vibes have I been given? So what did Elijah do? He challenged everyone. 
First, he talked about himself. I will follow God. I follow God. And he challenged everyone. He said, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. He said, then Elijah stood in front of them and said, how much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. There are people that in church, every Sunday, they are Christians. See them at work. See them in traffic. See them with their wives. You will even ask, ah, brother, <laughs> oh God, what does that even mean? <laughs> now what? Say it in English, please. Eh? <laughs> There's no trouble, but you understand what I mean. That, like, like wow, like brother, come on, come on. Remember what was said about the church in Laodicea in Revelations chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. Revelations 3, 15 and 16. It says, I know all the things that you do, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you are one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Whenever we have a dual life, in church we are Christians, at work we are not. We are denying Christ. And remember what Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 10 verse 13. Matthew 10 13. says, if you deny him here on earth, he will deny you before the Father in heaven. I know you not. Even though you call my name Lord, Lord. The next thing that Elijah did was actually physically building back the altar. Physically building back the altar. What are those things that you have that you know are things you ought to do as a child of God, as a believer, as a Christian, that you are not doing. Begin to build it back. What are those things that, yes, you are doing, but you are not doing as a believer. You know that you ought to do them. You are doing them, but you are not doing them the way you ought to do them. Repay it. Repay it. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 18, if you look at 30 to 35, it says, then Elijah called, let's forget that one. He said, verse 31, he took 12 stones, one to represent each tribes of, each tribes of Israel. Oh, sorry, I'll go back to 30. He said, then Elijah called to the people, come over here. They all crowded him, around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord that that had been torn down. Then he took 12 stones, one representing each of the tribe of Israel, and he used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. So the altar was rebuilt. The altar was rededicated to God. It is an altar that is dedicated to God. It is a life that is dedicated to God. It is an affair that is dedicated to God that God will come down to. Your broken altar may be your prayer life or prayerlessness. Your broken altar may be your word life, your Bible study life. Your broken altar may be your service life. That's why the choir, God bless you guys, and many other groups in church, the children, and many other groups, but the choir, God bless you all. You know, they've been through COVID. They were here. Um, just last week, I told them, what, the media, God bless you too. I can't forget these guys. You know, just last week, I told them, we're having this service for this young man that passed. About a day or something before it, or two before. They were all here. They left everything. As you leave everything for God, God will pay special attention to you. Then the last thing that Elijah did was this. And please take this seriously. Elijah followed protocol. See, listen to me please. When it comes to the things of God, there are specific ways that you ought to do it. Don't do it like a desicali. Don't. You know, and sometimes we get so modern. 
that we bring modernism into the things of God. The Bible that you see today has been the Bible since time immemorial, if that's English. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 36, 1 Kings 18, 36, it says, at the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed. At the exact time, at the time, he did not do it when it was not the time to do it. He did it when it was the time to do it. There is a way, there is a protocol that we must follow when it comes to the things of God. When God instructed Moses to build the ark in Exodus chapter 25 verse 40, Exodus 25 verse 40, he said, make sure that you build it according to the pattern that I gave you on the mountain. And if you read that story, after it was built, Moses was not the one that built it. Moses gave the instruction to the artisans to build it that God selected. But my Bible says that after the, uh, the ark had been built and all the work was complete, Moses came and inspected it. After Moses inspected it and he saw that it had been built the way it was supposed to be built, then he blessed them. It was because of the fact that it was built the way that it was supposed to be that the presence of God came. You cannot do God's things outside his protocol and expect God to bless you and expect the rains to come. When King David was talking about the things that he had put in place in 1 Chronicles chapter 29 verse 2, 1 Chronicles 29 verse 2, when he was talking about the things that he had put in place for the construction of the house of God, after God had told him that he was not the one that was supposed to build that house, he said, these are the things that I have gathered for Solomon to build the house of God. And he said, gold for the things of gold, silver for the things of silver, wood for the things of wood. Everything has to be done the way it ought to be done. Then finally, Elijah prayed to and depended on God for manifestation. Sars and ma, let me end with this. You cannot do it by yourself. You cannot do it on your own. And, and, and sometimes we get carried away. Take me for example. I've been a pastor for how many years? For years. I may think that I know it all. I may think that I can just go, okay, because I've been a pastor, I've done this thing for so long, so I don't need to pray anymore. Uh. <laughs> That's why I always tell people, I say, you know, sometimes nobody understands what it takes sometimes to come and stand up here. But I'm sure you all know, those of you that stand up here, it takes work. It takes prayer. Zechariah 4, 6. Zechariah 4, 6. It's not by power. It's not by power. It's not by might. It's only by God that you can do it. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 9, 1 Samuel 2 9 that by your strength, by strength shall no man prevail. Elijah went back to God and he prayed to God. Let's, let's go back there. The Bible says in verse 36 to 39, it says, at the usual time of offering, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this in your command. O Lord, answer me, answer me, so, the, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. You see the way he prayed? He prayed to God, but he pointed, he made sure that, he made sure that everything pointed back to God. Even for us parents, don't ever make your children think that you are the one that's doing it. Let them understand that it is God. 
Let them understand what it means to pray for things to come, to manifest. Bring them into those times when you are praying, you are trusting God for a new job. Bring them in. Say, look, I know you are two years old, I know you are six years old, I know you are 15 years old, but let's pray together as a family because daddy needs a new job and he needs God to do it for him. Then when God does it, let them know. Call them. Don't just tell your wife or your husband. Call them. Guess what God has done? That prayer that we prayed, God has answered. Do you know how that will embolden your children to hold on to the altar of God? Don't let them think that Superman is the one that does the work. Don't. Don't. No, I'm serious. Let them watch Superman. That's okay. I watch Superman. I'm even looking forward to this uh, Tom Cruise's movie. What's in the one that just came out? You people will act as if you don't know. Eh? It's Maverick, Top Gun Maverick, right? Okay. You see, I watch movies. But I read my Bible, I pray. Sometimes my wife and I will just say, this evening, no, we are just going to watch a movie. If anybody calls, we are not going to answer. <laughs> I'm telling you, so sometimes when you call, I don't answer. It's not as if I don't want to answer, but I don't want to answer. <laughs> we'll just decide. This evening, sometimes we'll say, ah, from Friday evening, Sister Rose is not around this weekend. From this Friday to Sunday, we're not opening that door. They will not, will not stay downstairs because you will hear the TV. We'll go upstairs. Then when someone comes, we'll not tiptoe. I'm giving you music, we'll not tiptoe. Go and look. Sir, it's Sister Ronke. Don't open the door. I can only use because we are, we've known each other for a long time. You know, why am I saying that? You know, yes, I watch movies. Yes, I do that. But it does not mean that that replaces or takes priority over the things of God. Gold for the things of gold. Silver for the things of silver. Please, priority must be on God. Don't be watching movie when you are supposed to be praying. Every altar that has been broken in your life, every altar of God that has been broken in your life and replaced by another altar, do something about it today. Please do something about it today. Do something about it now. Don't wait till tomorrow. Like someone said, if God ordains the end, he ordains the means to get there. Ask him for that means this morning and he will show you how to do it. Let us pray. Have you broken God's altar in your life in any area? The word of God is very clear about how we should live in every area. Speak to him. See, the God we serve is a merciful God. He's a loving God. He's one that wants us to do better. He's one that wants us not just to live here on earth. Remember what the Bible says. If in this world we have hope in Christ, only in this world, that we are for men most miserable. Ask him that, Father, today I want to rebuild my altar. The altar of God, I want to rebuild it. Everywhere that it has been, it has been broken. If it's in your prayer life, tell him that, Lord, my prayer life is not where it should be. I know you want it better. Your, the Bible says, pray without season, but I have ceased from praying. If it's in your study of the word of God, you are finding it difficult to sit down and read your Bible. I was sharing with us that a few of us decided this year that we are just going to go through the Bible again. And by the grace of God, God is helping us. It's not too late for you to start. If it's in the study of the word, ask him that, Father, I need your help. If you realize that your broken altar is that you are spending a lot more time in things without eternal value and less time in things of eternal value, ask him this morning that, Father, please, Change that for me. Change that story for me. See, your altar may be your place of work. Your altar may be your place of work. 
I was speaking to a young man in DC, in Washington DC recently when I went. He said, do you know that while I was working, he works in oil and gas, I thought this was it. He said, I will go to work in the morning at 7. I don't get back till about 9, 10. And I felt fulfilled. Then COVID hit. And I realized that I started work and I will end at 5. Then I asked myself after a while, what was I doing all this time? Working from 7 to 9, 10. That I have just gained my life back. You know where I met him? I met him at the youth convention. Gold for the things of gold. You must work. But don't let that work replace the altar of God in your life. Ask him to help you. Ask him to do it for you. And the change that you want, ask him that, Father, let that change happen today. I was sharing with someone recently. I said, you know, I've known you for years. I knew you from Nigeria while I was still in Nigeria. While in Nigeria, you were overzealous. You were zealous for God. What happened? What happened? And he said, the hustle is real. I said, God will not allow hustle to take his altar from you, uh, to replace God's altar. Ask him. Give to God. Because when he responds, he responds much more than you have given. Ask him. Thank you, Father. We give you glory, Lord. We give you praise. Rebuild the altar of God in our lives. In the name of Jesus. Father, every way that we have discarded, disdained and destroyed your altar have mercy on us today we rededicate our lives we rededicate Lord to build your altar to build that altar of God in our lives and in our families Father let it stand and let it be sustained in the name of Jesus thank you everlasting God blessed be Jesus' mighty name we pray.